Now let me go, let's move to leave that alone, and we'll come back to it in a minute. But I want to go to Latin America. Some of you have had experience in Latin America, either as missionaries or travel. Let me. Can I just see who's been in Latin America? Because it's looked like quite a few of you. Good. So we'll we'll talk about that just a, a little bit. <clears throat> John DeLynn brought to me, and what year did you come to BYU? Uh, well, 87, but 80. you met me in 90. In 1990. A dilemma of, uh, of him while he was serving a mission, being almost pushed, well, I shouldn't say beyond, being pushed to baptize people who probably weren't being ready to be baptized. Um, you, I actually encouraged you, and I know you wrote a letter to President uh, or to, to Elder Oaks and got a good response from him, quite a long response, as I recall. And um, I would just give you my experience. In 1996, we were called to serve as um, president of, of uh, Osorno, Chile mission. Osorno, Chile is the farthest mission south in, in the world. It goes all the way down to Tierra del Fuego and um, even the last, last island before Antarctica called, called Navarino, uh, Isla Navarino. And um, I, I, we really were excited about it. I'd had quite a bit of experience in Chile before that time. I went there to do my dissertation on a Fulbright Fellowship and um, had been back for reading papers and arranging a book to be published in Chile and so on. So I knew Chile fairly well. We got to the mission on a rainy Sunday afternoon it rains a lot in southern Chile. We got there in, Jan in July, the, the, the middle of winter. And <clears throat> as we were driving from the airport into the uh, mission home, the uh, two assistants who were riding with us said, President, the mission is going tremendously well. We had 462 baptisms last month. That's good. Tell me a little bit more. I said, we're most proud of our two-hour baptisms. And I hadn't heard of that. So what, what, what are two-hour baptisms? We meet people, and our goal is to get them in the water in two, within two hours. <laughs> and they all, ha all the missionaries had keys to the chapels. They would often meet people at uh, 9 or 10 at night and get in the, go in the chapel at 12 or, or 1 in the morning uh, and turn on the baptismal font uh, and sometimes have to get in and change, pull out the plug, and without, whatever. Every, every, and baptize people at, uh, at uh, 11, 12, or 1 o'clock in the morning. I said to these elders, I'm going to, you're serious, yes. Um, where does that direction come from? Because that's not what we've received direction for in, in our mission president's seminar. And the response, well, well that's, that's what we're all doing here in Chile. The church is really progressing in Chile. I said, what about repentance? I understand that repentance has to come before baptism. And they said, no, no, no. He said, they get, their re they get the Holy Ghost immediately when they're baptized, right at the, at the font, font edge, right after they've been baptized, they receive the Holy Ghost, and then that helps them repent. And I said, that's not the way I understand it. I think that you're supposed to be pure or clean before you get that, that Holy Ghost to function in you. And I said, what about meeting the bishop? He said, oh, they all come to church the next Sunday. Well, you can imagine that's not true at all. The missionaries were baptizing the people of the lowest will, people who would submit to being baptized within a, at a late hour. Sometimes it wasn't at, at, at that late, but uh, they were baptizing a lot of children. They were baptizing a lot of street people, uh, a, a lot of... Uh, <clears throat> uneducated people, who, a lot of out-of-work people as well, because those were the ones that were home. They met men and, and women who were out of work and, and baptized them uh, in the chapel. Not all baptisms were two hours, and a good many people resisted. But the majority of the baptisms were two hour, two hour baptisms. I don't know, if y yours weren't quite that fast. You, maybe you weren't pushed to do it in two hours, John. But the, the, the concept was the same. We've baptized a lot. Let me just give you a statistic for Chile. We look at Chile and the people out the church, throughout the church say, terrific, one of the great, most faithful countries in the church. We have on our records about 545,000 members in Chile, a little over a half of a million members. But on any given Sunday, there are only 58,000 who go to church. In other words, about 11 and a half or 12 percent who are in church. That statistic is fairly true for most of Latin America. 
for the total, comparing the total number of people baptized to the total number of, of people who are, are, are participating in church on a Sunday. In, of these 545,000 members, over 250,000 have been baptized in the last 15 years. But church attendance has only increased 2,000 during that period of time. So what we're talking about, terrific problem of retention. Although some of those people who were baptized have been retained very well, but others who were active 10 years ago have gone out the back door. And you may have seen those. That is, it's a rotating, revolving door. You're active for a few years, and then you leave the, the church. Right now, excuse me, in, in Chile, there are about 210,000 210, members on the lost records, the, the members of uh, unable to find membership. Uh, that's not really possible because Chile has a very good system of finding people. There's a national registration card that everyone has. Everyone in Chile has to vote. It's required to vote, so the government knows where you are. But we can't find over 210,000 people uh, in the church. Some of those, and I don't know how many, but some of those are invented people. Some of those are tombstone people. You may have heard of that type of thing as well. Missionaries who were pressured to baptize did what their mission president wanted them to do. And maybe you do. We found that I found that out very, very early on as a mission president that if I were if I required something, the missionaries would do it. And so I was very careful about what I required, or tried to be anyway, not requiring th something that was incorrect. Our first zone our first assistant who had been his own leader. We made his own leader after I'd only been there two weeks because the other one went home and I didn't know him. Was a great, great baptizer and that's why he was recommended to be the next assistant. But as I went down to the branch where he had served uh, in near Punta Arenas, right on the southern tip of the continent, I found out that most of the people he baptized weren't people. They were made up people. What did he learn, and what did the other missionaries learn from that experience? That by being deceptive, by being dishonest, you could advance in the mission. That's not usually the case, but it has happened in more than one, one occasion. My job was to slow down baptisms. We went from 450-something to down to 130, 140 a month which is still pretty good. Uh, most of the missionaries were finding, able to baptize someone every <clears throat> two or three months. But we went way, way down from the previous period of time. We were supported by the church in that. The church was not trying to get, simp simply trying to get baptisms. I, I report that because the similar thing is true in Brazil. Elder Holland came in the year 2002 precisely to change that, try to change that situation. Elder Oaks was assigned to the Philippines at the very same period of time. <clears throat> Argentina has not quite had as much of a problem as, as Chile has, but many of the countries in Central America as well have. Baptizing a lot of people, but not growing the church. And so when, <clears throat> before Elder Holland came in 2002, uh, in 2001, the church had started a period in Chile of consolidation. They'd grown to 118 stakes in Chile, amazing number, and, but they were such weak stakes and such weak wards, there were about 1,200 units, wards and, dis, wards and branches, and uh, 118 stakes. Starting in 2001 and ending when Elder Holland left in 2004, there are now 74 stakes in Chile and they're down to about 700 units from 1,200. Consolidating things, trying to make it stronger. The church had, had baptized people but had not retained. It was not uncommon to find uh, 25 or 30 people at a maximum in a large war building. We re recognizing this fact before Elder Holland came, I, I suggested to the uh, then area president, I said, <clears throat> when he comes, take him out to some place 
without being announced. If you tell them that an apostle's coming, you're going to get a terrific attendance. Don't announce it. He indeed went out to, <clears throat> there's a chair over here. He indeed was taken out the second Sunday he was there to a sacrament meeting in a town called Calagante. <clears throat> and when he got there at about five to nine, no one was there. The sacrament meeting was supposed to start at nine o'clock. At nine o'clock, he said, the two sister missionaries had arrived, <clears throat> the branch president had arrived, and that was it. And he said there were, there were five of us there. Sister Holland was with him. And <clears throat> he said by 9.20, when the meeting started, he said we had 13 people there. When the sacrament was passed, there were 20 people there. And he said, by after the sacrament, there were 26 was there. He saw a branch that was simply not functioning as a branch. And, and hence realized, we've got to make some changes. So the church went, as I said, from 118 stakes down to, um, down to, to 74. Uh, I don't want to go into too many more negative details because that sounds, that, that, that sounds like we're being negative. But we, we, we got numbers, but we didn't get converts. Some of you may have experienced some of that same type of thing. I, I don't know. But anyway, it's, it's sad for me to go back to Chile and, and find out so many people who are not active in the church who, who we thought were active. They were active for a period of time. Once I got into a taxi, and as I did, I was just asking the driver about, uh, in Santiago, asking about... Um, <clears throat> Uh, what, how much he made a day, how long he was r driving, and, and so on, and how, many, how much time he had passengers as opposed to time he was running empty. And, and then he finally said to me, he said, Ustedes son mormones, verdad? And I, I said, yes. And he said, you're, you're Mormons, aren't you? And he said, yes. And he said, so am I. I said, really? Uh, and uh, <clears throat> he was smoking when, when we got in. He put out a cigarette when he got in. But he was smoking, and I, and I just said, uh, I wouldn't have guessed it. And he said, yes, I've been a bishop. And uh, I said, then you're endowed in the temple. He'd picked us up right by the temple. And, um, he said, yes. And uh, I said, what happened? And he said, I got tired. I served as bishop. And he said, I moved from the ward because I didn't want to be bishop any longer. And I moved into another ward. And they immediately gave me a church calling. And I decided if I'd have a church calling, I was going to go inactive. Uh, that was sad. And I, and I said, don't you ever get a tug or a pull when you pass this temple? And he said, yes, I, I realize I've got to come back sometime. But at that point, he had simply made the decision. It was, it was too much of a commitment for him. And that's my, my concern throughout Chile and other Latin American, the idea of commitment as a tough type of, of thing. People commit for a short period of time. They don't commit for a long period of time. I visited a man who was a banker <clears throat> in a, at a town of Villarica beautiful town on a lake in Chile. And um, he had been branch president also. A and I uh, talked to him, and he said, what more do you want? He said, I've been to the temple. I've read the Book of Mormon. I've been a branch president. He said, that's enough. Uh, I'm, I'm saved, you know. I, I don't have to do any more than, than that type of, of thing. So we face a dilemma. Throughout the world, we calculate that now we have nearly 13 million members of the church. Only a little over 4 million of those would be considered active, participating members. In the case of Chile, there's only one temple in Chile for a half million people. Mexico has 12 temples for a little over a million people. Um, Mexico is a little bit bigger, I mean a bit bigger country, but not, well, it's, it's a bigger country. But, but why so many temples? Because in, in Mexico, they've been, this church has been established there longer. There is a commitment. Throughout the, the early part of the church, it seems to take longer to establish a commitment. Okay, let me just give some final points here. Uh, although they could go on for half an hour, but I won't. And then we'll see if you can ask some questions and talk about your experience. <clears throat> um, John has asked me to briefly say a word about harmonizing thought and faith. I never went into the gospel thinking that I was going to decide it's either true or it's not true, uh, and I've got to somehow harmonize problems that, that come up. I went into the gospel because it was a satisfying experience for me. 
and also because as a, as a young man I really sought and wanted to find out if what my parents had been teaching me was, were true. At age 16 I had a beautiful privilege of um, going down on the desert in, in uh, southern Utah. I was good friends with a fellow named Clark Tanner and his uncle O.C. Tanner and his father Norm Tanner. Decided that they wanted to get Clark out of town because he was started drinking uh, a bit and wanted him to go off with a good Mormon, I guess. And so they bought us a Jeep. We took a prospecting class at the University of Utah and uh, find out. This was the, day, the days of the uranium boom. Salt Lake was the penny, the penny capital stock of the world in the 1950s. Uranium was big. It was as big as the gold rush. Uh, and, and you had possibilities of getting richer much faster as well. Charlie Steen did, as you may have heard the name. I hope you've heard of Charlie Steen. If you've heard of Ed Abbey, you should know Charlie Steen. <clears throat> anyway, um, we took our prospecting class. The day school was out, we took off for, in this terrible old jeep down to the desert, drove down to uh, St. George, picked up a geologist friend uh, of, of O.C. Tanner, and then drove out onto the desert by Pangu went through Panguitch, Escalante, and then down the Kaparowitz Plateau, turned off to the right, went over and down on Last Chance Creek. And we were really isolated. There wasn't, uh, there were no roads in there. We just did where the jeep could go. We just followed the, the stream bed bottoms. And Last Chance Creek wasn't a creek. It was just a dry river bed or stream bed. And we unpacked after <clears throat> that second day on the road. I realized I hadn't brought anything to read, and I was really enjoying reading. I'd read Wallace Stegner and a whole bunch of other things dealing with the West, and, and, and I was in, just enjoyed reading. I didn't bring anything, but I got to the bottom of my duffel bag, and there was a book there. My mom put it in. <clears throat> it was a Book of Mormon. I'd tried to read a Book of Mormon a couple of other times uh, when I was a youth, and made it through First Nephi, and then the second time I got into Second Nephi, <laughs> Chapter 9, and couldn't go much beyond that because it got involved with Isaiah and <clears throat> gave it up. But out on the desert, I didn't have anything else to read for those first months. I had a companion who slept a lot, and uh, especially in the morning when it was cool, and I always woke up and, uh, as soon as it got light. And so I read the Book of Mormon pretty fast, <clears throat> in about two and a half weeks, read the whole thing through. I hopped out of my bed and started to pray, and nothing happened. I'd read it and I said, come on, what's going on? I've had the experience here uh, of uh, reading the Book of Mormon, and it says right here, if I read these things and ask about it, I'll know something. Well, nothing came. But I didn't have much else to do in the mornings when my companion was sleeping, and so I started reading the Book of Mormon again. And didn't get through the whole, all the way through that, that second time, but somewhere in, in as I recall, in, in Alma chapter 40, reading about resurrection and, and so on, without praying about it, all of a sudden, I really knew something. I got that warmth, and I, I don't want to make you feel uncomfortable, but, but many of you have had that as well. All of a sudden, an incredible feeling came over me. This is true. This is right. I know this. And my mind started racing. At the time, I didn't recognize it, but I do now as a manifestation of, of the Holy Ghost. And I said, my parents have been telling me the truth. This is right. <clears throat> David O. McKay, indeed, is a prophet of God, just like I heard him say uh, one time uh, when he was visiting our ward, telling about his experiences of hearing God. And, and all of these things just flowed through my mind very, very rapidly, uh, saying, yes, and the Book of Mormon is true. The Book of Mormon is an ancient record. It's not written by Joseph Smith, and, and so on and so on. It kept going on very long. When I've doubted, <clears throat> and I have doubted even in, in, in this stage in my life, I even have sometimes doubted the existence of God. I don't anymore, but I used to. I come back to that experience and say that's, that was something that came to me from something much beyond me. That wasn't me that created that. That came to me. And I've had enough other experiences, a good many of them, similar enough to say that's really true. I can't say, as, as some do, that the Spirit tells me everything to do. I have a hard time with that being guided by the Spirit. It doesn't seem to happen very often. If I teach a decent lesson in, in, in to missionaries at the MDC or in classes or whatever, I say, yeah, I prepared and the Spirit guided me in my preparation. But I don't, I'm not told what to say at, at the minute I'm teaching. We tell our missionaries that that will happen to you. But I've had that experience way, way too infrequently. My spiritual prep, my spiritual help comes at the time that I'm preparing the lesson. 
Uh, and I don't know if that makes sense to you, but it, it's something to me that even bothers me when I see some people in the church who say, oh yes, everything I do is guided by the Spirit. It doesn't work for me that way. But, but if it's working for some, I'm, I'm glad that it does, and, and I, I'll have to accept that experience. So I can just say that when I have doubted, I come back to this experience on the desert and many others that say, this makes sense. If I had a, a pencil, I'd get up to the blackboard. I mean, I had a pen, I'd get up to the blackboard and, and draw on this. Some type of a continuum and saying, here is, here is the line of, of my, my life. And there's only a little bit here on one side or the middle, if you will, maybe I'm going to say the left side, that is doubt or, or concern. But the rest of it is, is surety, faith and understanding and knowledge that this is, is true. Now, I can't rationally explain why I know that the Book of Mormon was written by ancient prophets and not by Joseph Smith. But that's part of the sure thing right now. And if that's true, then other things are true around the edge of it. And so that's the way that my faith functions. That I, I can say there, there's a room for doubt, and I don't have to have final answers to everything. And I've learned to say there's enough surety, there's enough truth, that if there's doubt or concerns in some area, I can live with that. Because there's enough other surety that makes, that, uh, it, makes it work. Now, I'm, I'm not sure that's enough uh, of the... Uh, of telling you the experience, but I wanted to let you know the idea in Latin, Amer Latin America. In the last few years, because of these church calls, we've had quite a bit of contact with the First Presidency. Just two weeks ago, we had a, a, a three-day session in the temple with the First Presidency and, and the, uh, many of the members of the Quorum of the Twelve. Good experience, confirming experience, that, that this is right, this is, is true. But most of you haven't had that experience, and so I'm not hearing say, ha-ha, look what we've had. No, but I'm just simply saying, those are confirming things that say, I can still fight and study through difficult problems, but there's enough truth and enough reality that it makes it true. And that's where I'll stop and say thank you, and we'll let you ask questions or comment if you want to make any comments. What do you think has caused the change in the culture from when you were younger and you talk about the way things were and sort of the openness of that? So yeah, very good question. The growth of the church and the necessity to be unified, to do things the same way. Uh, when I was young, we had to, uh, we had, we could talk about what, six or seven temples in the church. Right now, we have 124. In our temple ceremony, they talked about what they called temple drift and how things get drift away from the norm. And so the church has said, we can't have temple drift. We want it to be quite boxed, because if you're going to attend the temple here or in Washington, D.C. or in, in Buenos Aires, we want you to get the same experience. And so there's been that uh, thing. The, the, the other thing is the church has become much more worldwide, not just by, by numbers, but we've moved out. We've ceased to be that, that Wasatch Front Church, and we're much more open to the press. And so... We, 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 don't want to, we, we don't want to know about the conflicts that, that may exist in the Quorum of the Twelve. I, I'm, I'm really glad that, that there are ones. But, but my experience with Elder Holland lets me know that there are uh, still things. And it's a good... Many of you speak Spanish, I suspect. Who's, who's learned Spanish in Argentina, Chile, or Peru? Uh, been in those countries. I just have to tell you a, a brief little story. <clears throat> Elder Holland told this to, to me, uh, to, to us, my wife and, and me. Um, he was working with a group of state presidents one time, trying to talk about the, the inactivity in Chile. I was asking why, and this, they were speaking in Spanish, and he was, was using whatever Spanish he could pick up. And he said, ¿Por qué tanta inactividad? Why, why so much inactivity? And then as he, would, as he was uh, saying, as they would say something, and the best he could, he would write their answer on the board. Usually they were one-word answers, uh, like... like um, uh, no home teachers or, or um, <clears throat> no commitment or something. And one, mission, one man said to him, one state president said, falta de apoyo. You know what the yeah. word means? Falta de apoyo. Support. Yeah. Lack, of support. Lack of support. And Elder Holland went to the board and wrote down, palta y pollo, <laughs> which means avocado and chicken. <laughs> And he'd seen avocado and chicken sandwiches. You, you, you had one tonight, didn't you? You had I did. precisely. You had one tonight in a little Chilean restaurant up near our house. And uh, anyway, you wrote Palta de Apoyo. And he can tell that story. Now, 
but you wouldn't want to, he, he wouldn't want that to be public for some reason. I don't know why. But you see, that, that, that shows one he didn't, know Span didn't learn Spanish as well as he should have, uh, and there's maybe a little more humor than it should be. But anyway, it's a, something you, you, you may remember. Let's go. I think that in some ways that, that correlation has a lot to do with uh, keeping things yeah. the way that it is. Um, because I, I have a friend that worked for BYU Hawaii, and his experience was uh, after the tsunamis came, after the tsunamis happened, in, uh, in Southeast Asia, Elder Bednar and someone else came and spoke at BYU Hawaii, and they spoke very in a very down-to-earth, very personable way, and they posted it up on the website, and then within a couple hours of them putting it up on the website, they got a phone call, you know, saying that, that that's, no, you need, you need to take that down. That's just yeah. not, that's mm -hmm. not appropriate. That's not how we want apostles to be seen. Why, yeah. why do you think that there's this fear... Of, of seeing like our leaders as as just worthy, committed, really intelligent yeah. people, and not as you know these near celestial people that yeah. you know that a lot of people think they. Let, let me just give you other examples as well. Um, <clears throat> Elder Holland came into my office one day for his Spanish lesson, and uh, in Chile, and said, and he saw that I was writing in my diary while I was waiting for him. And he said, oh, Ted, you keep a diary. And I said, yeah. And he said, I, I he says, I don't. I wish I know I should, but I don't. And I said, why don't you? And he said, he said, because I saw what happened to Ernest Wilkinson. He said, Wilkinson kept diaries in such detail of all of his redoings with the brother. And he says, they, of course, filtered through his uh, very candid uh, but, but biased eye. And he said, then they were published, and he said, he's embarrassed so many people. He said, I'm afraid whatever I, uh, I say might be misconstrued years down the line. He said, as it is, he said, I write an email, to, send an email to my kids, and he says, an hour later, it's on somebody's blog or somebody's web page. Uh, and, and he said, and I thought it was just to my kids, but he said, somehow someone mentioned this to that, that person, and it's there. And it's part of that communication. So anyway, that, I'm just giving you the example. There is that fear, because I think they're concerned that, that we're not as strong as we, are, as we ought to be. That they're concerned that something's going to be said that's going to weaken our faith and it's going to hurt us. That's my uh, observation. We've got some super intelligent people uh, uh, that have been selected for general authorities recently. Uh, we've got, what, four university presidents now in the Quorum of the Twelve? I think there are four ex-university presidents. Elder Oaks, Elder... Um, Iring, Elder Holland, and Elder Bednar. And, and um, that's, you know, they're, they're not choosing dumb people. They're, they're, they're choosing very intelligent people. People who also have their doubts and their, their concerns. Anyway, th that's the best I can do with that answer. I think for me, like I've read, I've, I'm, I'm reading Rough Stone Rolling for the second time through. And I've read the two books that Ed Kimball wrote about his dad. Mm -hmm. And for me, reading both those books and, 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 and reading about um, them in very human terms was actually very faith-affirming because it said, sure. you know, to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, you don't have to be perfect. You just, you have to be committed yeah. to more than anything else. And so I think that, you know, if we, if we could talk about these things and I, I guess would you say inoculate the... Um, like inoculation is the, is the big word on the web. On the web, if we could talk about it in that way, I think it would help people's faith. I, I do too. This was my father's big push uh, all of his life. He'd gone back to the University of Chicago and gotten a master's degree and worked on his PhD, but the war came along and he didn't get the PhD there. He got another university. But um, his big push from the University of Chicago, the Divinity School there, had really big people, someone like Edgar Goodspeed, if you know, some of the best names in, in the 1920s and 1930s in, in Christian history. And uh, my father said, let's find out what really took place and tell it like it was and not gloss over this. And he was probably the first person in the church that started publishing articles in the, uh, about that idea. Because he said, I don't want people to find out at age 30 
something about church history that, that they should have been taught when they were 15 uh, and it's going to cause them to, to get upset and leave the church at that time because if there's enough truth that it'll still be there even if there were some problems at, at that time and we find that with Joseph Smith or whatever. I haven't read the second book of Ed Kimball's but I've read the first book, uh, the, the first biography as well as of course Rough Stone Rolling. It's, it's, it might be, you know, first of all, it's true your dad was sort of the expert on Joseph Smith in the Nauvoo period sort of in his day. Correct. Um, but, but it's probably worth having you talk a tiny bit about how the Leonard Aaron, uh, how the Lowell Benyon sort of T. Edgar Lyon experience ended, because I think that probably there were people who didn't agree with your dad's philosophy, and maybe that caused him a little bit of pain. And I'm not trying to put salt in old wounds, but I mean, there's a real dilemma and attention, and probably not consensus on whether your father's approach is the healthiest one. Maybe you can talk mm -hmm. a little bit about any part of that you want to teach you too much about church history more than you want to know, but um, <clears throat> Ernest L. Wilkinson became president of the BYU here in 1951, almost sim uh, simultaneous with the time that President uh, McKay became president of the church. Shortly after, he made himself not only president of BYU, but uh, head of the church education system, which meant he controlled all seminary and institute teachers. Um, he, he desired power. And he was a very energetic, hardworking, and fine man. I, there's maybe a grandchild here. I better be careful so I don't want to offend the, any grandchild. But um, Lowell Benyon, who was the director of the Institute in Salt Lake City, where the majority of the children of the general authorities attended, uh, was, in fact, my, my father taught uh, both the President Faust and, and President... Um, and President Monson were, were students in my father's class. They, they went to the university. You didn't go to BYU. The General Authorities kids just didn't find it was a good enough university in those days. Um, anyway, Dad um, and Brother Binion had had some conflicts with Joseph Fielding Smith, specifically over the book Man is Origin and Destiny. It was a book that had been agreed not to be published back in the 1930s when Talmadge and Joseph Fielding had a, a conflict over that, uh, over the whole concept. Talmadge was accepting evolution and Joseph Fielding was not. <clears throat> in 1961, uh, I'll just be very honest with you, a, uh, Wilkinson planted a, a faculty member at the University of Utah who was a spy uh, to teach at the, at the, uh, in the institute there and to report to him on a, on a regular basis things that were said by T. Edgar Lyon and Lowell Binion. That was part of the boy. I'm biasing you this from my standpoint. I'm sure Wilkinson would tell you another way, but, but this, the fact is true. At the end of that academic year, 1961-62, uh, Ed Barrett, who was Wilkinson's uh, hatchet man and his vice president, came up to the University of Utah and simply said, um, <clears throat> we'd like to offer to you the chance to come down to teach at BYU. Uh, and that was the, the offer he made. And, Wilk and Benyon said, if I don't, what will happen? He said, you will not have a job any longer in the church education system. Wilkinson had, had fought with Benyon over the uh, position on the blacks, uh, having the priesthood. Benyon was trying to push the blacks to get the priesthood. He, uh, Wilkinson wanted to have grades in, in the institute system, which in those days the institutes didn't give grades for classes and so on. Wilkinson wanted to have grades so they could transfer to BYU and get credit here and so on. And so Wilkinson was essentially fired because he didn't want to come to BYU. I mean, Benyon was essentially fired because he didn't want to come to BYU and be that close to Wilkinson. Uh, my father resigned uh, at that time because he, he supported Benyon. Benyon was the director and the, the more vocal man. <clears throat> and uh, am I telling you, we're going in the right direction here, John. And, uh, and so anyway, that ended the, the Benyon Lion era. Benyon immediately was given a job across the street at the University of Utah as the uh, so assistant or associate dean of students and became very well known for his activities and even the University of Utah now has the uh, the Benyon Center there named for him for all of his social involvement. Um, my father came back at the, at the request of, of the church, he came back and taught at the Institute after a couple of years being away. He also taught and he just went across the street into the history department at the University of Utah and um, was accepted there. It seems like I'm supposed to tell more of that, but what that, that, that conflict indicated was that, uh, that that's a, a time 
when there was, we're starting to say, let's be careful of dissent among our faculty. Benyon was dissenting with, with the, the head of the uh, seminary in the system, Lowell ben, uh, uh, Ernest Wilkins, and as a result, um, got in trouble and, and, he, and he got fired for it. He, he probably went on and did better things outside the institute than he had done at the institute, but he, he made contributions to many, many people. I still, this, to this day, whenever I go and speak to a new group of anything, I'll still run into people who are much older than you, my age or older, who will say, oh, your father made, kept me in the church. Your father made such a difference in my life. Or Lowell, he and Lowell Binion were, were the ones that, that, that are responsible for, for me this day. Even when I talked to, to President Monson when I was doing this book, and I quote it in here, uh, he said, uh, I'd never learned how to study. You know, I didn't go on a mission. Uh, uh, you know, that he didn't go on a mission because he'd served in the Second World War and, and, and the church told them to not to get their education after they came back, and most of them didn't go on, didn't, uh, didn't go on missions. He said, but as your father, he says, as I was doubting, and, and, and didn't know, he said, I didn't know how to study the gospel. He said, your father taught me how to study the doctrine and, and covenants. He said, I'd never cracked the scriptures really before that time. And he said, I learned how to, to study the doctrine and covenants through your, your father's classes. So they filled that function, but that era ended in 1962 when, when Lowell Benyon was fired. And it feels like the church has gone through a bit of a pendulum where it wants to be candid and honest and it tries and it makes a good effort. And then uh, there's some discomfort and so it feels like it has to sort of pull back. I believe that's right. And you can see that in the, in the 70s happen and then in the, and then in the 90s and now we're mm -hmm. having sort of a, a swing back to openness again. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think so. Under President uh, Hinckley, sure. Anything else? Don't want to keep you too late tonight. I have a question. Um, I served a mission in Venezuela and about the same time that you were mission president down in Chile and had a similar experience that John did where there was an immense pressure to baptize and a lot of dishonesty with baptism and I came home and had a lot of anger about it that I eventually just kind of like let go. But I'm just curious as a mission president, where does this pressure, I mean I've heard that, it comes, you know, like it comes up the, the food chain or whatever, you know, that there's there's pressure yeah. from the general authorities to, you know, that is put upon the mission president. But I, I'm just curious if you would comment about what it's like being Thank a you. mission president. The, the, I, I've mm -hmm. contemplated the same thing. Why did the previous mission president, to me, put this type of pressure on his missionaries? He was a former military man from Uruguay, and <clears throat> I'll give you my own feelings because I think there are a couple of, there are multiple things. A mission president many mission presidents want to make a name for themselves. I believe that most of the pressure comes from the mission president himself. But he also receives a report from the area to which he's involved. You were probably South America North area at that time, probably headquarters in Colombia, I think. Yeah, I think so. Or Ecuador. Maybe Ecuador. It's now in Colombia of all curious places mm -hmm. that they, they run it there. But anyway, uh, Elder Dinas may have, David Dinas may have yeah. been your area president at that time, wasn't he? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the area publishes a, li a comparative list of baptisms in, in each country, uh, a baptism or in each mission, I should say. And so you look at, as a mission president, you look at that and say, oh my gosh, our baptisms were 130 or 40 this month, but in Santiago West they baptized a thousand, and I'm not exaggerating, they, they did that. What's the matter with us? And so you start putting pressure on your missionaries to baptize. And the pressure comes mainly from the mission president and for two things. One, his comparative, as I'm saying, comparative analysis of him and other missions in his area. And you, never, you never see a comparative analysis of the whole church. They don't, they don't give you that. I kept each of these sheets and the church has wishes I didn't keep them all now because I give, I'm giving them as I'm retiring to the BYU library and they'll be available for other people to see. But, uh, but I wouldn't donate them to the church because the church wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't make them available. The church wants to keep that. But anyway, so it's a pressure the mission president creates for himself and then the fact that he's probably trying to make somewhat of a name for himself. Not all. That that's, would be very incorrect to say that, but many of them want to say, I want to do the best we can. There's another factor too, and that is that as a mission president, we know that missionaries want to baptize, and they get great pleasure out of baptizing. And uh, if, if you do, then we're going to try to put pressure on you enough that you'll do that. Uh, 
if a missionary goes six months in Chile without a baptism, he starts to get pretty discouraged. And, and so the, um, the idea is, okay, we'll, we'll get somebody in the water, baptize someone. John tells of a story of uh, having to drag a, a, an older lady down a mountain, as I recall the story, to, uh, to, it was the end of the month and they had to have his baptism for the month and this lady was kind of kicking and screaming, but, uh, but you got her in the water and... Wasn't me. It wasn't you, it but... It was the APs in my mission. The, the AP, yeah, who came in and made it. Yeah, right, okay, thank you.